Hello, everybody. Welcome to Daddy Talks with today in the Brad headquarter with Clive Schley, CEO and the long-term friend and mentor of mine. I was really looking forward to chat with you because there's a lot of things to chat. I took a whole pages of, of, of notes. I wanted to start with the, with the journey of Brad because I think everybody who I know remembers the first time entering Brad when they are on holiday in London and remember the first sandwich they eat. And for me, that was like groundbreaking. But I think also you joining 17 years ago, what was your first thing you remember about Brad? When was the first time you entered and you felt connected to the brand, independent from you joining that? But what was your first? I think I, uh, I first went into the Pret in Cannon Street in the city, and it was just an incredibly fresh and bubbly experience. And I just went away in clocks. It must have been 10 years before I joined that. Uh, this was a very special company. So it was very early beginning. Yeah, so it must have been in the, in the uh, mid 90s. And what made you join in back then? You came from Hong Kong back or what was your start? Yes, I, I actually spent uh, 17 years working for Jardine Matheson, who a big, uh, big British company in Hong, Kong. in Hong Kong. And I ran their restaurant businesses, uh, you know, Pete's Huts and Sizzlers and Tucker Bells around the world in Asia, um, in America mm -hmm. and in Hong Kong. And I came back aged 38 because I was determined to live um, in England so that my children would get to know their grandparents. Okay. And I wanted to get back before I was 40. So I made my wife promise me she'd leave Hong Kong with me <laughs> before the age of 40. And we came back in 1997. And people who come back from Hong Kong are, are called astronauts. They have to make a new life. And uh, I, uh, I had to make a new life in Britain, having not lived there for 17 years. And uh, I, I started looking around for businesses to buy and to get involved in. And for five years, I had no income. So and I had three young children with no income. And I met uh, Julian Metcalf uh, just after he'd opened the first uh, Sue. It was called Sue Restaurant. It was mm -hmm. now Itsu. And he and I went into business together. And we for Itsu originally. For, for Itsu. It mm -hmm. was then Sue. We called it Itsu. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for five years, we worked together at Itsu. So I got to know him. And that was a, you know, the most important meeting of my life, was working with Julian. Changed your life. Changed my life, definitely. He's, a, he's an incredibly positive, powerful, powerful person, and uh, he changed the angle of my life. I want to talk before we come about the brand and the product of bread. For me, the most fascinating thing about bread is the people culture, because what you build over the years, when I talk to headhunters, they say you don't even need to call somebody on the senior level or an ops manager to kind of steal them from bread. You cannot steal people from bread. There's a very high loyalty to you, to your management, to the brand. How, how you built that loyalty? How, 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 how bread became the people company? Because at the end of the day, it's a sandwich store. So how you made it a, a people company? Well, I think in the very early days, um, Julian and Sinclair recognized that to get people to get up so early in the morning and work and make sandwiches in difficult conditions, something had to be special. And they, they inherently sensed that giving people a future and giving them friendship and making them a sense of family was going to be very attractive and much more important than money. Money had to be good, but those three Fs, the future and friendships and family, that was the beginning of Brett's culture, which is, I hope, stayed throughout. I've always tried to encourage those, those, those three. As a result of that, uh, people get very loyal to Brett. And um, as you say, it's difficult to headhunt them away, which is, we like that very much. Um, and I hope it will always stay that way. And you have an internal promotion system, university, or how you raise the people from the, because there's a lot of people I met over the years, thanks to you from your team, and we walked around and visit different stores, and you always hear the stories. I started as a cashier, I worked myself up to like a district manager, whatever. What, what's, what's, the, what's the structure behind, what's the system behind well, there is a, it? There is a very disciplined uh, system behind our academy, and every step, there is an increased pay rate and a series of, of, of a quiz. So you climb up and up and up and up, and there are many chances to climb, and that's, uh, that's very important to Brett. And then we give the lessons and the practical experience so that people can move from uh, being a team member training to being a, a team leader, to being a system manager, to being a general manager, to being an ops manager. It goes every step of the way. We, uh, we encourage them and, and push them as a following wind. And I think that Brett has something like 40% uh, of the people who join Brett get promoted, which must be a world record in an organization. That's crazy. 
That's amazing. So basically, I know when I do a good job and when I follow the plan, you already set out in two years I will be on that position, I will make yeah. that and that money. So people yeah. can plan with that. They can, right? see, they can see a chart showing them to, you okay. know, how to climb up. and that's very How many important. people you have now working for you? I think it's 13,200 or something. So. In how many countries? You know 103. That? 103, 103 in countries. And oh I, want my to God. Say, I want to pay particular tribute to all those of people who come to London and, and at Pred around the world who, who come from different countries. I believe if you come from another country, you're a very special person. You've already left a country to, do, to come to Britain, and it means you're emotionally very tuned to adapting and, and succeeding. So Pret would never have existed without these wonderful people who come from all over the world. So you're United Nations? We're the United Nations of sandwich makers. It's very and nice. Them. I want to talk about the rising stars because I know that this is a very uh, passionate project of yours. You write in the CEO blog, what you have on the website. By the way, I recommend that. Go to bread.com and read the Clive's uh, blog. But let's talk about the, the rising stars because that's a project that is very close to your heart, I think. Can you tell us something about of that? Of course. So, uh, Pred has been associated with helping the homeless since the very early days. When we first made sandwiches um, in the mornings, I think Julian Sinclair recognized they could never, ever keep the sandwiches overnight. Mm -hmm. So, we gave the sandwiches to the homeless. From day one. From day one. Very, from, well, from the, the day we started making the sandwiches in the morning to, the, to, um, to within a couple of years of Pret starting. And uh, so we always were, were being generous to the homeless with food. But there is a, there's another thing that matters to homeless people a lot, which, which is what they most need is a job. And simply giving them food is not enough. So we started to work out how we could give them a job. And eventually we have, have developed a program which, which uh, is, I think, one of the most successful in the world of giving, our, giving people who have been homeless, uh, we, we get them recommended to us by hostels um, and organizations mm -hmm. and ex-offenders, and they come and work in PrEP for, for, for 12 weeks. Um, we give them a, a zone one, you know, zone pass, a, a London Underground pass, and, um, and we make sure they can get up, and then we give them a buddy, and we really train them with care, and they can, they can uh, become and get careers in, in PrEP. And now, now the earlier people are coming up and becoming managers. We have our first general manager Amazing. of a shop not far away, just, just down there in, in Caxton Street, uh, Anya from, the, from uh, uh, one of the rising stars is the manager So there. where do they live during the work? They still live then on the street? Or how no, no, no. They, we, you get it, them into it, homes? It is, it, it, we, get, we, we normally get recommended. Um, we, we, we have to choose the rising stars very carefully um, because they look like all the other team members, and it's important they blend in with the other team members, and uh, they get selected by you know, homeless organizations who go, you know, that person has the capacity to work in Pret, and, and, and they put them forward to us. So that, that partnership with the homeless organizations, there's, you know, there's 15 or 20 of them that we're, we're talking to all the time to make sure we get... Uh, so how many rising stars you had integrated? We've, we've had 480 altogether so far that have come through the system. It's amazing. Yeah. But I also know that you take time in the summer in your house in Austria. Yeah, lovely Austria uh, for you, Lovely yeah. Austria and, and the, take them hiking. So, yeah. so why are you doing that? Well, it's a funny thing. Uh, uh, we, began to get a, we began to get a program called the Shooting Stars, which were for the, for the rising stars that were, were getting promoted. And our team at the Prep Foundation developed a program in the, with another outside company at the Isle of Man for, you know, for a week's training. And uh, they went off there. And when I heard about that and I heard what had happened, it seemed to cost us an awful lot of money to go to the Isle of Man and have another outside organization doing all sorts of appraisals and discussions and roundtable groups. So I said, I, you, know, you don't just spend 20,000 pounds on that, I'll do, it for, I'll do it for the cost of an airfare. And so I said, I'll climb a mountain with, with the rising stars. So for, for the last few years, and I'm, I'm going actually next week, how many are you taking? I'm taking seven next week um, up this mountain called the Große Rettenstein, which is, uh, I, like, I like this mountain. It looks very hard to climb, and the last bit is quite fiddly, but fundamentally it's a safe mountain, and they see it for all the way, and it acts as a symbol of their life. When they get to the top, they're going, this is my life, I've, I've done it, I can amazing. do it. And um, not all of them get up there, but that's part of the, that's part of the game. That's amazing. Another impressive thing, I think, what is very uh, tied to the bread culture is the, the, the theme of food waste. You mentioned it a little yeah. bit before, but you have a very structured approach to food waste because the strategy is that when I walk in as a guest in the evening, as a last guest, I still should have a, yes, yeah. a, a kind of uh, sort of yeah, yeah. yeah. closing range. Yeah. Obviously, that comes that the closing range is left. Yeah. So when does this whole food waste, because I think you started way earlier than others to, to deal with yeah. that. Yeah, I think that was as, 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 uh, in the early forms in the late 80s, but by 1995 it was formally codified and we started organizing trucks to collect from the shops. 
And actually, it's not very easy to get a truck. You've got, the truck's got to have, say, 20 shops to go to. He's got to know what time they're closing, come at the right time, and, 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 get, the, um, and get the sandwiches that are unsold, and then take them to the different hostels. So I think we have eight trucks now doing that. And you also do that abroad in France? And in we, every time we open up anywhere, we try and find the charities to do that. I think we're something like 90% of Amazing. I want to talk now about the, the product because everybody I talk to, when you walk into bread, you, you already know what, what you take. You, you have a very, you have regular uh, guests, obviously. So how difficult it is to do a food development because people know what they like, they go for that. And on the other hand, you, you, you want to be innovative. And I just saw down there you had a lobster roll. I was yes. very surprised that I will have that after, uh, uh, yep. afterwards. So h how you deal with that, like, um, the, the signature product versus the product development and, and also the, the warm food because I think when you started you were pretty much only cold and sandwiches. Yeah. So how do you deal with this whole product development versus the, the superstar products here? Well, it's like a river with lots of little currents going on in the river, this. So uh, the first thing I think is some customers enjoy some superb products that they come back for again after again and again. And some of these products haven't changed for 30 years. Um, so the smoked salmon sandwich, which is um, you know, butter, 66 grams of salmon, and um, uh, some lemon juice and some seasoning, that is an unchanged product since I've been in Pret and probably you know, 10 years before. Always the always. same. And the, the, the uh, very berry bowl, which is wonderful, the best granola, the best compote, the best yogurt, that doesn't change. Those things, so I think those things you need to have constantly there. Occasionally you treat them to get them better, but you're quite protective of them. Mm -hmm. And then at, at the same time, you have to keep changing a few uh, you have to keep change coming through so there's new news. And the worst thing that can happen is if you simply innovate to replace one product with another one that doesn't sell any better. That just slows everything down, confuses the customers and, and the staff, that doesn't help. So you need to try to make sure the new products are better than the old ones. And that, that's the discipline of a food meeting, is to really challenge the team to say, is this soup better than the one it's taking away? So what was the biggest success in this almost two decades where you said this was really a product what came out of nowhere and took a significant uh, um, share of the sales? I think, I mean, the introduction of new categories in Pret has been very successful. So when we first moved into soups, when we first moved into salads, when we first moved into coffee, these categories were the big changes. If you can invent a new category, which only happens once every five years, that can lift, lift sales 10% or something. It's very, very powerful. There are little small innovations that come through, like when we did cold press juices, we, we saw them in America and we really raced to get them race to get them here, and they were a great success. Uh, our, um, most recently, our, uh, our vegan uh, almond butter cookie chocolate cookie is, has incredible loyalty. I think at one point, one third of social media comments about prep were about this cookie. Nice. So these are these, are these little star products that, that, uh, that keep a lot of energy in the, in the company. What was the biggest failure on new products where you said this will work and then it was like, uh, didn't work at Julian all? Julian and I invented a, it was a, be a baked bean breakfast. We called it Beano's Brunch. It was just a disaster. <laughs> so not not we, every we not were everything to, we were works. Back to our childhood in the Beano magazine, but the, not everything not works. Everyone was on that. Uh, let's talk about the the veggie bread because I think two years ago, or yeah, three years two, ago, three years two ago. three years ago, uh, you and your team opened the first veggie bread, and it was a lot in the media, and you were very humble about it. You say it's a pop up. We're going to listen to the market. You took a very nice site in in Soho uh, yeah. uh, about that. So how was the journey so far on the veggie bread? Well, I think everyone, when we had the board meeting for the, you know, decide whether to do veggie bread, we actually all voted against it. But <laughs> <laughs> everybody voted against it. Was, we had a meeting of all the different priorities and, we, and everyone, the board, board concluded we shouldn't do it, but I kind of sneaked it in. And it has a, such a powerful momentum among the people who work for it that they carried on working on the project. And then we un, unleashed um, veggie bread onto Soho. And there was something about the green the greenness of the sign is just it's very hot. smart. It, it yeah. Really, and the landlord won't let us have that green signage anymore now. So the shop doesn't have the green signage, but the, that green signage there signaled a big change. And suddenly, the whole shop was was full of um, of uh, young people sitting on the floor. I mean, they couldn't they couldn't find a seat at the table to sit at. Uh, and there's something about vegetarian eating and vegan eating that is a very positive moral force. And I think Pret is going to do its best to to drive that force. How many you have now? So we've got four now, but we're, we, we just, um, uh, you know, a couple of, couple of weeks ago announced the acquisition of EAT. Yeah. And the purpose of that acquisition is to, is to really get a lot of veggie pret so we can put full food resources behind it. Do you think you will get 
different uh, clientele with that or is it a substitution? What's your thought on um, that? I think it's, I mean, you don't want it to be too much substitution, obviously. So I think there are different clientele out there. There's a very passionate vegan and vegetarian community and there's a lot of people who who are just starting to eat less, less meat, myself included. I mean, everyone is thinking, how does their stomach feel at the end of a meal? And they are beginning to realize they feel lighter and better after eating vegetarian food. The problem has always been making the vegetarian food good enough. And there's nothing worse than bad vegetarian food. I mean, that really is sad. So if you can get the vegetarian food good enough, then I think, you know, then it's a fantastic place to play. So I'm hoping that uh, when we open the, the first of the new Eat Veggie Preps later this year, people will go, wow, they've taken another step forward. And I think that's relevant because I want to ask you, I mean, the brand is three decades old. And, and there's so many trends what came out in these three decades when nobody anticipated. I mean, the whole landscape here changed. And, and how, how you stay relevant with a brand what is three decades and, and on every corner, that's quite a challenge. Uh, well, I think it, it's, it's, there's obviously there's four parts to Pret and probably to any food business. You know, the first is um, the proud and professional staff. And, and we've talked about the staff. They are, at the end of the day, they have the biggest impact on, on the customers. So keeping them caring about their job, caring about what they do, that is our number one task. And making things easy for them to do it, which we don't always do, but making it easy for them to do that is absolutely critical. The second thing is, is you know, the delicious, freshly prepared food. And the fact that we make the food on the premises, which you know most of the competitors don't make the food on the premises, the coffee shops, do not have kitchens and they will not be able to produce but a sandwich like we. And you can tell the difference. One is one is a couple of hours old and one is a couple of days old and there's, there's a difference. And the third is uh, engaging communication and keeping the communication that Pretz had. And we've, you, know, you've, you, you can see it on the bags and, and uh, the, way we, uh, the way we address the customers, which is... It's a which broccoli is, here. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, well, that's a, that's a nice vegetarian, the veggie, veggie New Yorker. But we'll turn it around. And, <laughs> Looks uh, better. <laughs> and that, that communication is, is critical, keeping consistent. When we deviate from that communication, and sometimes we do, um, actually, it, it's like a, a wrong musical note for me. I, I, I really feel the pain. And then finally, you talked about the shops on the corners. If I was telling anyone to set up a retail business, the corners are the king. And you never pay as much for a corner as a corner's worth. And if I could call Pret, the Pret Corner Company or the Corner Pret Company uh, to make sure we never went off a corner, I would, because it's uh, those, four, those four are very strong uh, pillars for the business. For success. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the international experience because you grew up of a, of a home base. I mean, in, in, in uh, London, you own the high street, as uh, Alex said before, uh, in, in the car to me. So you own the high street and then you start growing. You establish business now in the US, you're in France, you started in UAE, you have a Hong Kong business, what is quite established. If you compare the different market and experience, independent that obviously all of them need a ramp up to be there, but what is there any major learnings or deviation, where does the concept work better, where you need it to adjust? What, what are the learnings on the international growth so far? And it's a huge subject. And Pretz had very mixed experience internationally. We've had some uh, wonderful successes and we've had some terrible, terrible, painful failures. So uh, I've, I've, I've been through both. Um, I think the best thing that you can do is, if you can get a local national to run the business in the new country, and somehow know that local national is immersed in your culture. That is a wonderful starting point. So uh, we have a wonderful man called Stefan Klein who, who runs our, our, our prep business in Paris. Mm -hmm. And it's the combination of his knowledge of the, fre the, the French food scene with his capacity to, to mix with the British here in, in Victoria has been the has been the rock of the, the success of that business. So it's slowly and steadily Prep France has built up, I think we're 30 shops now and, and growing. And uh, We've only lost five general managers in seven years. And wow. that is a, is a foundation. So this foundation of building the skyscraper where you build a substructure first, that has to be done. And then, then, you, get, then you, get a, you, know, you, you can come out of the ground. If you try and rush it too much, uh, it can blow away. Do you need to adopt a lot in terms of uh, product offering in the different countries? You, I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, you do have to locally adapt. And um, I mean, America is famous for this. You can think America eats the same way as Britain, but, but, but it's not true. And they drink their coffee in a different way, much more filter coffee, so completely different from espresso-based coffee. They're much more salty and spicy. Mm -hmm. um, their names are different for products. And you have, a, you have to establish the core uh, concept of what you're about and then locally adapt it at the end. So we have an 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm. and, um, but if anything, it's to be 70-30, but 80-20, 70-30. So, Feeding, I mean, as Julian always used to say, our job is to feed 
you know, natural delicious food, um, and it could be any kind of food, natural and delicious food, healthy, healthy food, at affordable prices around the world, and, and that's what we try and follow. I remember the times when you went to the website and you looked for franchising and said, don't even write us an email, yeah, we don't do franchising. Yeah, and, and then over the years, you changed the culture, you yeah. signed the first uh, franchise partners in yeah. France, in, in UAE, you announced several travel hubs. So what, A, how that mind, uh, mind shift came, and B, can you share some first experience with, with franchising, with yeah. partnerships? Funny enough, we, did, we do have, we have a few, A, franchisee in, uh, in London, a, a chap called Gerard Loughran, who's, He's got seven shops now, he's an extremely good operator. So we've always had that experience of a very good operator. We've always wanted it. So he ignored the warning on the website. He was then. invited in prior to the warning. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so he'd always been there and he's carried on opening a lot of shops now. Yeah. Um, and then as we went started to go abroad, uh, it beca became clear that it was going to be naive to think we could do everything on company stores. Yeah. Uh, partly because the cost of capital would be so huge and partly because a lot of the sites in which PrEP could do very well, like airports and railway stations, are in the hands, as we all know, of um, major travel companies, and you simply aren't allowed to compete in some of these places. So we slowly, first of all with SSP in the Garde de Lyon, which is a magnificent location, which um, they've been operating very successfully, and then now more recently in HMS Host, I think we opened in Los Angeles um, last week, some big numbers coming out of there and Las I Vegas. I heard you're number well. two there. Yeah, number, two, and, and number two, I thought we were number three, but number two in the airport. Well, I heard, little, just, little, I just little, heard that. Well, little prep being number, th number two in LA, I mean, we never, we never exempt that. So which country you think would work tremendously? Which, which country people should write you an email now? <laughs> why, why you like to open? We, that, <laughs> uh, we, have, a, we have a kind of pretometer that says where countries would be Will be good for prep, depending on the, you know, depending on the, uh, uh, the, the pet flows in the towns, the amount of people coming to work, the eating habits. Eating you need a strong out. commuter. Uh, we, we, we like office workers. We like we love skyscrapers. So skyscrapers mean affluence. Skyscrapers mean people probably conscious of their of their health. Skyscrapers mean proximity. So we we like skyscrapers a lot. Um, I'm curious what we're gonna see. I want to talk about the different ownership structure what you have because when you started, you started with two visionary entrepreneurial uh, founders whom you helped to structure the business. Then you got private equity on board, Bridgepoint. You managed that over several years. You did a very successful exit for them. Now you have a family office with with Yap, and so basically you had three very different uh, owners. What, what's the learning on that? Was it the right owner for each time? Or how can you keep the, 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 um, the culture stable? What, what are you able to share in terms of these different ownership structures? Well, I think before you, um, before you agree to sell to a company, you need to have a very good look that that company is qualified to buy you. And uh, I, think, I think that's happened every single time, that Pret's taken a lot of trouble on whom it's chosen to, to sell to. And Bridgepoint always promised us they would respect the values of the business. And they, they, did? they did, they totally did. I mean, they were, they, they were quite a strong following wind to push us internationally. And um, maybe we went a bit faster than we might have done otherwise on our own. But they, were, they would never have encouraged us to, to, to shortcut anything on the people culture or, or helping the homeless or anything like that. If anything, they were saying, do more of that. So that was a very good understanding. They had a, they had a very useful discipline in saying, we need to make the business look good at a certain date, look ready for sale. And that's quite, that's quite, a, it's quite a useful thing for business to have, to say, well, why am I a good thing to buy? Because it does, does discipline the mind. So you, you, you find them, there's all sorts of techniques you use, but you show that you have runways for growth. And you haven't necessarily got to build them all out, but you've got to show them they're there. And then you've got to keep the momentum and the, and the, and the, uh, the light for light growth up. So, so Bridgepoint were very, very strong at doing that. And they chose uh, a good time to buy and they chose a good time to, to sell. And uh, they had it, had it for 10 years, which was, which was fantastic. You got, before we come to your new shareholder, you got the very, very positive recognition back then because you did something very unusual. You shared part of the profit with the team and everybody, I think it was 1,000 pounds, if yeah. I recall yeah. correct. Uh, and and 1,000 pounds is a lot, uh, A, for the people working for you, but B, if you count that together, it's really a lot of money. And, and I have been in the process and it takes quite some courage to convince somebody to give so much money out there. But it was overwhelming the, the, the feedback what yeah. you got from the people and the success. Whose ideas were that? Was that was wonderful. Well, I don't want to claim the success for myself, but I did have something to do with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was, just a, it was a lovely thing. And I got letters from, 
Nepalese from Hong Kong and, and Americans, all, all the different staff members saying what a, what a huge difference it made. I remember um, when I got to shops, I had notes from the French in Paris, and it was really fantastic. Um, it's very nice. And we were lucky, we had a little stash at the time of the sale in the accounts, we could sort of launch it off with. And then we went to the, we went to the sellers and the buyers and said, would you top this up? And Brett was a small enough company to make it affordable. I mean, we had 12,000 people on, but so it cost 14 million, but um, it's, a lot of money. it's a lot of money, but it's a small enough to be able to afford it, but large enough that everyone took notice of it. So it set its... Standard. I hope you're going to set a, a benchmark well, for actually, that for Wagamama others. Well, actually, Wagamama copied it. That's nice. Them, so that was nice. Maybe they call it the Clive bonus later. No, 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 the Brett. So how is your new home? How, how you feel with the app? How is this new platform? Because I think you even, they even call it Nabanero Brett. Is there any synergies? Do you start exchanging with the other coffee shops they have? Or how, how you feel there? Well, um, uh, Jab have been incredibly proud of buying Pret. They always say how much they love us, which is very nice for us to hear. And uh, they want to make sure that we keep our own culture, which is good. They're also very keen on growth and long-term growth. So they, are, they, they always say they're going to be the last shareholders of Pret, and because um, uh, they never want to sell us. And so that means we have a long-term outlook, nice. which is nice. A long-term outlook, which is which is which is a bit different from the Bridgepoint approach. Um, they are encouraging us to get to know our cousins and all our brothers and sisters, and particularly on the on the digital front, where you know Panera have a very you know, strong performance in the U U.S. They're encouraging us to learn from that, encouraging us to learn to buy buy better together. Um, but by and large, they're not a very big office. You know, there's only 27 people in the head office of Jab, and by and large, they uh, you know, they, they they want Pret to, to be true to its destiny. And they want it to be a global player, you know, particularly in urban um, urban centres. So, in this new ownership, uh, a first big deal, I think, what we heard was the buying of Eat, what was yeah. basically the only copy out there, what what had a significant number of outlets. What is a big step, I think. You already said you're going to convert most of that to to, to veggie bread. Is there any major strategy change? Because if you look on UK, you come in some city centres almost to a saturation. You're trying now, I think, hospitals. You're trying. Yeah. universities yeah. so what what will the growth going to look like uh, with, with such a big uh, shareholder in the back more corporate stores more countries i think it, i think which direction is we going to see there will be a lot of work on the uh, on the digital side i think pret is always under indexed on catering and delivery i think well i'm embarrassed to say how much our uh, what are the low percentage of sales our catering has but it's far far lower than it should be and in places like new york city where where delivery should be 30% in the winter um, we are so far below that, it's a joke. So I think uh, we will be investing, and we are investing a lot of money on ensuring that we have a fantastic... Delivery. But there you have a perfect uh, cousin because Panera was always exactly. very, very front-running yeah, on that. But I think they can learn the, the product quality and, <laughs> and the innovation on that. Because this disruption wanted to, to, to touch, and you know, we, we, we had it in all the daily talks how the digital side disrupted the industry and some interview partner said on a fast casual side that they believe it 40 50 percent will be if it's Sunday afternoon you don't want to go out how how did it already affected you because you, you gave the feeling you started a little bit too late so you already feel some I think um, the, the problem Fred had was that we actually have to make sure we're solving a computer problem solving a customer problem so we were giving you know, we our food um, Customers can buy the food very quickly. So mm -hmm. simply solving a speed problem, which say Starbucks might have with, their, with the ordering coffee, or Panera might have with ordering making food to measure, we don't have that because we can serve our food very quickly. So we have to to make sure that the digitalization that we use is really solving customer problems. And the main area for that is in is in catering and delivery. And I think everyone in the high streets has felt the cream come off the top. They felt the cost carrying on increasing. Mm -hmm. And they felt the cream come off the top as businesses moved across to, to deliver and, and, and uh, people like that. So, you know, Pred is affected by that. Fortunately, we're more breakfast and lunch than lunch and dinner. And of course, the majority of the disruption has been in dinner, but it, it still seeps into lunch. I'm curious what you're going to see. It was the first time when I now went to your website uh, to check your latest blog entry that I was asked for my mail address if uh, I want to register. It's the first time that I felt that Brad kind of tries to get yeah. a, a, a customer yeah. data because so far there was we've no been, loyalty we've, program. Yeah, we've, um, been, we've, been, been, we've been very face-to-face. -face. Yeah, and very face-to-face. 
I wanted to talk you through Europe, European. Uh, you said you're kind of hosting the United Nations of Sandwich. Uh, I know that you travel a lot. How, how does Brexit affect you as a person? What do you think about that? And what, would it, what will it mean for, for your business? Well, I mean, pret manger the name says it all. It's a French name. Our staff are from all over the world. Our customers are from all over the world. We're very heavily involved in London. So it would be very strange for me to say I'm excited about Brexit. And so we are now, you know, it's now what, uh, in June. No one knows what's going to happen. The, the Tory party leadership campaign is taking place. Um, and we're all quite nervous about uh, how, things will, how things will fall out. So far in the business, um, the two things have been striking. One is that the consumers have not stopped spending particularly. It's got a bit got tighter, but it hasn't sort of fallen off a cliff. And secondly, threat staff turnover has not increased. In fact, if anything, it's come down. Mm -hmm. And um, our staff, you know, we're still able to find, find staff in, the, in, the, in, the, in you know, good staff. I think there's an element where the people who used to come join prep, maybe thinking they'd stay for three months and then they'd end up being here for 20 years, which are the spine of the company. I'm feeling some signs that that kind of person is not making their life in the UK, which is heartbreaking for Sorry. Heartbreaking for me, heartbreaking for Brett, and frankly, heartbreaking for the UK. Do you have any kind of, because you run a big business here, any kind of emergency escalation plan on the Brexit in terms of sourcing food and sourcing people? How you prepare uh, for that? Because nobody knows what's going to happen, so it's difficult. We, um, we don't have an emergency plan to ship in 12,000 more people. But um, uh, the food, we have quite a lot of plans on the food, on the major food items. We have quite a lot of plans. We have a, these long relationships with our suppliers. So uh, even in the event of a no-deal Brexit, I think the food will, it could take a few days, but we will eventually have the food there. And the, men, the menu can be adjusted to, um, to cope with certain food outages. And if we're the same as everybody else, I think that, you know, we won't get punished for that. But it, uh, it, is, it, is, it is heartbreaking. I want to talk a little bit about your management style. What, what because you, you came here, you built that structure. When, how many stores was when you came? It was 115. And now you have 400, 500, 570. 500. So quite amazing. Also, a change in structure. You talked about the university. What kind of of leader are you? How you run that company? Well. The first thing I think the leader has to be is be a happy person. Yeah, <laughs> so, a teddy bear. <laughs> I think being a happy person, being positive. I, I always tell our managers that uh, um, the, the story I met, the, the boss of Barclays told me that he worked in Central Park and, sorry, he, he worked in New York and he was living in Central Park and he took his, he took his dog for a walk every morning. And uh, he noticed he, 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 he started writing a book about what his dog could teach him about life, Management Secrets of Sammy. And Sammy's first secret was, wag your tail. And because if you watch a dog, if it wags his tail, the other dogs in the park are happy, the other dog's owners are happy, and you're happy as a dog owner. And so the managers, they need to be positive because all the staff are watching them. They're watching their every single move. So if they can be wag their tails, when they're, particularly when they're tense, because it's very hard running running prep, there's 500 things can go wrong at any point. So if they can wag their tail, that is wonderful. And I intend to have a waggy tail, although there have been times uh, it doesn't, but I try and keep it wagging, and I think that's a, that's, that sets a good tone. I, I want to touch a, a, a period what happened just a couple of months ago when you had this uh, tragic tragedy. Yeah. Where, where it was difficult, I guess, to, to work the day. And, and I, I don't look for an official statement because you get a really, really good statement and counter -action. But how was it for you personally to keep up in that time? Because especially when you're talking about wagging the tail and smiling, I think in that period of time, everybody looked at you, not just the employees, the whole nation. How, how you felt? Well, I had to say the tail didn't wag as much as it could have done. And um, maybe that's the time when you shouldn't be wagging your tail. Uh, but it, is, it was a terrible thing. It was a terrible thing what happened. You had a heart of stone not to, to grieve over what happened. And, you know, Prep found itself in the, in the epicenter. So uh, I think we could have, done, could have handled it better, but it's very hard at that, that, you know, in those given days and but hours when the pressure is coming on you so great. But I think we've been very solid in our, in our long-term response. We've really taken things to heart and we've revamped our systems. We're now rolling out labeling um, on all our products. I think we're about a third of the way through now. And um, it's been a strong statement. Uh, so, you know, PrEP will be a better company as a result. And, and, and they'll, be safer, they'll be safer for allergy sufferers in the whole industry because the law is now changing to follow PrEP's example. So, and how you handled it as a person? I, I uh, 
Well, I'm glad I stayed, I stayed up strong, but I, I, I find it incredibly hard, incredibly hard. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. You had somebody helping you? Um, you had a counsel, a mentor? <laughs> I, I had a, I had many people um, supporting me, which was, which was very kind. And I did, I, I did uh, go and get some help, and they, was, they were good. Thank you for sharing. So looking back now, because it's a tremendous success story, um, if, you, if you kind of try to, to weigh between hard work and, and luck, over these almost two decades here, what you've built together with your team. How much was momentum, luck, how much was really hard work working against some, if you, if you find, try to find a ratio, how would you? I think, I think uh, we had some very good following wins. And um, my, my wife always, uh, she always says anyone, any damn fool can run Pret. Um, <laughs> she hasn't said that in the last year so much, but uh, <laughs> she, and, what, and what she meant was that you've got, um, you know, we had we had the, the, the natural the desire for natural healthy food was a very good winner for us. Uh, the growth of London and the vibrancy of London and the availability of all the people coming into London was a fantastic you know, workforce for us to have, and, and London as a city has grown with Pret Pret. In the early 80s, London, the late 70s, London was not a great place. And Pret grew out of that and has grown with London. So London's Pret's special friend. And so I think that's been a very lucky thing. And then my personality came in at the time, at, at the right time in Pret's growth. And there was a, was a natural happy marriage between the two. So whether that's luck or hard work, I mean, I certainly worked hard. Um, only, only because I loved, I loved it. And um, so it's a combination of those things. But never, never assume that it's one's own ability that... Is the key factor here. Is sure. a lot of, uh, the following wins matter a lot. I always get the request when we air that is the, always the, the comments are you sitting with people who travel so much, who are foodies, ask them the favorite restaurant, the best meal. So I, I need to ask you that because we always get that. So w what's the restaurant you go? What's your, your restaurant where you say, this is, my, this is my, my living room. I love to go there. It has a special vibe. What's your yeah. favorite restaurant? Well, the one that's closest to home is. Uh, is Tozy, funnily enough. It's close to Victoria, which is run entirely by Italians. There's a very nice, spacious dining room. There's Venetian, Venetian tapas. That is the closest thing I have to a canteen. And okay. um, in the country, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a pub called The Unruly Pig, which I can walk across the wood from my house in the country. And I, that's almost a canteen for me as well. So nice. I very seldom have a meal when I haven't investigated where I'm eating in anywhere around the world. I will take a lot of trouble never to waste a meal occasion and never to waste a, uh, waste a meal. So what was the best meal you had? We talked now about oh your two restaurant, but what was the outstanding, the outstanding meal? Oh dear, so you've, put me on a, you've put me on the spot here. I um, need to do that. I think, Otherwise they complain again that I didn't yeah, I ask. think the Portland, uh, the Portland restaurant, Great Portland Street, and Clipstone in Great Portland Street yeah. are doing a very good job at the moment. So. We've been at the Portland restaurant last time. Did, you, did we, no, we, we nearly went to it. Oh, we once, once went there. I think I was there with Let's you. Always somebody from your team who very, followed you. I had a very nice uh, birthday party there the other day. So, talking about birthday, you became 60? I did. This year. So, what's the, what's, what's the outlook? How long are you going to run a, a big vehicle? How are you going to see the next 20, 30 years of your life? You want to stay that much day to day? Yeah. What, how do you see yourself in the next 5, 10 years? Well, I've been at Pret a long, long time. You have to be you always have to be careful not to stay too long in these places. And as I've now turned 60, I'm beginning to, I think, they, I think there's two kinds of, you, two kinds of virtues of your resume virtues, which is when you're accumulating and opening shops and increasing gross profit and EBITDA and, and so on. And then there's uh, your eulogy virtues, which is how people will really look at you as a person. Now, unfortunately, they probably won't remember the fact that Great Portland Street has 44.8% GP. They, no. they will remember that way you handle things, how you treated other people, what you did for... What you did for how many people you helped and growing. How many, and also the adventures that you've had and the personality you showed. So I'm kind of moving in that, in that direction now. So, uh, Creating you know, memories instead, of, instead of numbers. I I'm trying to, and I always want to help the prep people. I'm really keen to help the prep people uh, in the future too. So at the end, we need to talk about that because guys, you see, there was a, a, a copyright incident Stealing, stealing, stealing my teddy bear. So we, we, <laughs> we need to we need yeah. to talk about that. Thank you for your time. It was a great talk. Uh, I think the people will enjoy it. And and you are a special teddy bear, so you get the teddy bear here. What was sitting here. So thank you, Clive, for that.
I used to have a teddy when I was a boy, Mr. Snuggly. So you get you get a new one. <laughs> Thank you for for listening and and uh, visit the uh, Brett.com, the CEO blog. It's really nice for Brett about Brett and especially Clive has to say there. And uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Good. <laughs>